Turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. We'll look at these two verses really over the next few weeks. We want to read it today together. As you're turning there, it's been over the last few weeks that we've been looking at the purity of the church. And in doing so, we've been growing in our understanding of Christ's rightful reign in his church and then the spiritual end to which he has saved her, and that is to be his holy and his pure bride. We saw in week one that this begins with an understanding of Christ's rightful lordship of his church, that he is the eternal son of God through the eternal counsels of the Godhead, was appointed by God the Father to carry out God's plan of redemption. It was accomplishing that redemption as we learn from Colossians 1, chapter 1, verse 18, that Christ now reigns over all of creation and he sits as Lord of his church. He is the one, as we learn from Matthew 16, that through the Spirit-revealed confession of Peter, that he was God's anointed one, his Messiah, the one that the Old Testament prophesied would come and would deal with man's sin once and for all. Again, he did so not because he was merely a good teacher, not because he was a miracle worker, but he could do so because he was God in the flesh. And in doing so, could satisfy in perfection every requirement of God's righteous law. It was this purchase of the redeemed in Christ that now make up what we call the church That spiritual body of Christ composed of Jews and Gentiles being brought into one new spiritual entity, the church. It's this church that we learn that he alone does and can build. That although Satan and his world system seek to destroy it, seek to undermine it, it is Christ who will prolong and prevail his church to their glorification. It is in redeeming her and prevailing her that he will present to himself and to the Father, the church, as a pure and a spotless bride. It is his desire for his church, not only that they be positionally pure, but his desire for his church is that she be pure, unstained by sin, and untarnished by iniquity. While we discovered that this is a positional reality that Christ has accomplished on our behalf, we also understood that as believers now in our sanctification, we are working that reality out until glory. This was the path that we saw in week two, that Christ has provided both a corporate path to our sanctification as well as an individual mandate to our sanctification. The corporate path aspect as we learn from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 10 through 13 and first of all involves the equipping of the saints the teaching and the shepherding of the saints by God's chosen men who through their prayers and their teaching and their shepherding they are equipping the saints for the work of service that is to say that as the body of Christ is growing in a knowledge and an application of the truth, and as they are using their unique spiritual giftedness to edify one another, as Paul says, that the church grows in greater conformity to Christ. It becomes more pure, progressively holy, like Him. But as we saw also, there is an individual mandate given there as well to pursue Christ's likeness. We call that progressive sanctification. It's a process that we pursue in accordance with God's instruction that we would grow individually greater conformity to Christ. As we saw last week or two weeks ago from Philippians 2, verses 12 through 14, we learned that this isn't a passive process meaning it just happens or we're somehow zapped with it, but rather we learn from the Apostle Paul that we expend maximum spiritual effort to do so. We learn that doesn't happen through some mystical experience that leaves us frustrated, but rather it is utilizing the truth of God's Word as the sole instrument of our sanctification, and that as we pursue that, aspect that God is there both energizing that effort and he is both producing the fruit. But conversely, we also understood that we struggle to grow in Christ's likeness apart from pursuing that path. 
Meaning that though I am well-intentioned and have decided to go on my own way, I will not grow in Christ's likeness if I do not follow God's path to do so. In the church, it is when sin then is allowed to go and dress that it can take over time to dull and even harden the hearts to the extent that a person becomes unrepentant, obstinate to the commands of Scripture, and they must be called to forsake their sin. It's this unrepentance, as we learned last week, that can threaten both the purity and the unity of the church. And Christ himself provides then with the church, with the process, the practice to deal with unrepentant sin. And that is the process we learned last week of church discipline. We saw that process from Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, that has the purpose of maintaining purity and unity in Christ's church and the goal of restoring an erring individual. We saw last week that it is a four-step process that our Lord gives us that grows in greater accountability as each of those steps progresses, and that's contingent upon the unrepentance of the person. It is the grace of God that desires that at every step that this one strange sheep be restored through repentance back to the body. We saw that that repentance is not merely a confession, but like all true biblical repentance, it must demonstrate that repentance in its fruit. And in doing so, the desired outcome is the repentant individual then is restored back to the body. We learned last week that there are four steps to this process, a private confrontation, a group confrontation, a church call to a confrontation. And if those are denied and that person is still living in unrepentant sin, they are to be removed from the fellowship of the church and not led to believe in any way that they have any part of fellowship with God's people while they still remain in unrepentant sin. As we saw last week, it is this reality that as the church practices this church discipline, that Christ, in being active in his church, is making a heavenly declaration of his judgment. It's the reality that as the church practices church discipline, that Christ is being active in his church and making that heavenly declaration through it. We learn that this process outlined for us in Matthew 18 has three exceptions to where those third and fourth steps of church discipline must be moved to urgently. It's those, first of all, who bring false teaching into the church. Those who lead people astray. Secondly, where someone's unrepentance is public and an open shame to Christ as it was there in Corinth in chapter 5. And also, when individuals come into the church and seek to divide the church, these are three exceptions that must be dealt with urgently and quickly in order to preserve the unity of the church. We also discussed last week of when this formal process should begin. We learn that as believers, we understand that we are all beset with those weaknesses and those sins that are a reality within the body that we should be bearing with one another those burdens. We learn that within the body, there are certain sins that while they are ongoing personal struggles, that they may not reach the height of a significant threat to the unity and the purity of the church. They may be able to be worked out privately in a progressive manner, many times unbeknownst to the rest of the body. But for those who are demonstrating clear unrepentance and there is a significant threat to the purity and unity of the church and where the name of our Lord's work could be compromised, then the formal work and process of church discipline must be carried out. But it's because of our own weaknesses that it produces in us a patience and a gentleness, as Galatians says, in dealing with one another. That while these sins, if allowed to fester and remain unrepentant, could serve as the feed bed for more serious sin, our body is somewhat willing to absorb those personal weaknesses of those in our body in order to help them to be sanctified through them. It's this reality that brings us then to the process this morning of purity. The process that the Lord gives us for biblical change. Maybe you're not familiar with the process of biblical change. Maybe you yourself have been frustrated 
While in desiring to change, to to throw off these besetting weaknesses and sins, and yet you find yourself over and over being plagued by them. Maybe you've not seen any true pattern of obedience in your life, no true victory or progress in your sanctification regarding these areas of sin and weakness in your life. Maybe it's because of this that even you have grown in lack of your assurance, even if you are truly even in Christ. I want you to be encouraged this morning because in our passage this morning, in the next few weeks, the scripture gives us a clear and defined process to produce biblical change in our life. Paul describes that process for us here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. He says this, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, That you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If you indeed have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth and in Jesus, and then here is the process, that in your reference to your former way, manner of life, that you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. It's here in this passage, as well as in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, that Paul provides us with the three steps to biblical change. Three spiritual actions and realities that if they are faithfully carried out, we will grow in our sanctification. And in growing in our sanctification, we will preserve the unity and the purity of Christ's church. But before we look at this process that the scripture gives us to produce this change, I want us to this morning lay the foundation for the need for biblical change as well as examine some of the faulty views of change that have been proposed over time. And then Lord willing, next Sunday, we'll examine the process of change itself. But this morning and over the next few weeks, what I want us to see is that the process of biblical change begins with God's truth about man's sinful nature. It is motivated by God's provision of redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is possible by being made new, a new spiritual creation, and it pursues the application of His truth as the sole instrument of true change. A lot of these realities, then, the Christian must reject all faulty paths of change and pursue God's ordained process for change. I want us to begin this morning by examining man's most basic but serious of issues. First point I want us to examine is the battle for the beginning and understanding of man's fundamental issue. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2. Look in verse 26. It's here in Genesis that we are introduced to the relationship that our spiritual parents, Adam and Eve, had and enjoyed with God. In verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth. Every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which have life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. 
It's after the creation of man, that in creating man and woman, that God sees all that he has made, including man, and he says that it's what? Very good. Chapter 2, verse 25, adds this. It says, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. It was at this stage after the day six, that the Lord called everything very good and that Adam and Eve enjoyed a relationship with God that was untainted by sin. Moses records for us here that both Adam and Eve were naked and yet they were not ashamed. That is, that they existed as those who did not know any consciousness of sin or moral guilt and shame before God. While they were still dependent upon God, they enjoyed a perfect and a sinless relationship with Him. They were in not need of change because at this point, that need did not exist. They lived in constant communion, in constant holy fellowship with God. But in Genesis chapter 3, we see that our spiritual parents fell into sin by taking of the fruit that God had forbid them to eat. It was through that sin of disobedience to God's revealed will that our spiritual parents lost their spiritual innocence and became inherently and totally corrupted by sin. In doing so, they were subject to God's judgment for sin. Sin brought with it death, and by nature they became utterly incapable of choosing or doing anything that was acceptable to God. It is Adam's sin that made him not just one who sins, but rather in sinning, it caused his entire nature to become fallen. To say it a different way, there was not one part of Adam's being that was not corrupted by sin. It is this sin that Paul tells us in Romans that everyone born of Adam inherits Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. It was in that act that man fell into sin and out of fellowship with God, and in doing so, the sinful nature of our spiritual parents is passed on to every person born of Adam except our Lord. Listen, this is man's greatest issue. This is his greatest dilemma. And this is his greatest need. Man by nature has no power to restore himself on his own. He is hopelessly lost in sin. And apart from divine grace, he will remain in that fallen state. Therefore, man is a sinner by nature. He is one by his own choosing, and he is one by and through God's divine declaration of his nature. This is man's fundamental issue, that by nature he is sinful and he falls short of God's righteous standard. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. This is your spiritual biography before Christ. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, what? Children of wrath, what? Just like the rest of humanity. Notice here from the text, the fall into sin didn't happen gradually. It happened instantly, immediately. It didn't happen over time or gradually, but instantly. Adam and Eve's relationship to God eternally changed. They went from perfect fellowship with Him, union with Him, with no guilt of their sin before Him, and enjoying that communion with Him, to being those who through their sin were now separated from God and were subjected to the realities of their new sinful state. Notice in Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 13, we see Adam's response to God in this new, newly fallen state. First of all, 
He was aware of their spiritual guilt for their sin immediately. It says the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. They had just been those in chapter 2 who were naked and what? Not ashamed. But now in sin, they see their naked state through the guilt of their sin. Of their sin. Secondly, they became self-righteous in their condemnation. Notice how they try to remedy the situation. Instead of coming to God in a full confession of their sin, they attempt to remedy their sin on their own. Sowing fig leaves, external things that they would believe that would create or cover their nakedness, believing it to be something that they could do to truly deal with the issue of sin. Thirdly, they did what? They hid themselves from God. They tried to hide themselves from His holy nature, fooling themselves that an omniscient, holy God would not find them in demand of their sin, but rather believing that they could somehow escape their accountability to Him, they tried to hide for them for their sin. This is who man is by nature in his sin. He pushes back on his responsibility in sinning. He will attempt to carry out his own sin in private, believing that God cannot and will not find him out to hold him accountable. Then he says what? We were afraid. We were afraid. Adam says he was afraid because he was naked. But that wasn't the reason. The pre-incarnate Christ walked through the garden as he had done so previously in perfect communion with Adam and Eve. In doing so now, Adam hid himself. It was out of the fear of the consequences of his sin that instead of making full confession of it, he gave an excuse that he was naked. Not that he had sinned. Not that he had come to realize his relationship with God had been separated by that sin, but rather he hid himself in fear. His confession itself exposed Adam's sin, the fact that he knew that his relationship with God had changed and it was confirmed by his guiltiness of sin. But he wasn't just fearful because of his sin. Fifthly, it was also because he also attempted to blame others for his sin. Instead of confessing his sin before God, Adam tried to blame who? Eve for his sin. It was the woman, he said. She was the one who gave me the fruit. She is the one who is really to blame. Adam's saying what? I'm the true victim here. This is mankind's story. Always looking to pass the buck of accountability before God for his sin, man believes if he can just pin it on someone else, that he himself cannot be held liable for sin. In verse 12, and verse 13, that sin led Adam to question God's design and to act in defiance of his revealed will. It's here in being questioned by God that Adam exhibits man's sinful response when he is accused of a sin. It moves far beyond trying to blame someone else for sin to accusing God of not being as holy as he truly is. Adam, in an attempt to cover up his own sin, says, God, you don't know what you're doing. You're not as holy and as wise as you have revealed yourself to be. See, the point here is that man by nature is not a confessor of sin. He is a deflector of his sin. Although he is sinful by nature, sinful, and sits under the judgment of God for that sin, he will deny any accountability to his sin. He will believe he can escape God's knowledge of his sin. He will blame others for his sin. He will create another path to deal with that sin. And he will even go as far to accuse God himself of that sin. It's out of man's sin and his depravity that we will see next the believed path to remedy this issue of sin. Man's fallen understanding of how he attempts to deal with his greatest issue of sin. Next, I want us to see the plausible but perilous paths to change. The plausible but perilous paths to change. Look at 
What we must understand about man's nature is that he is always attempting to remedy his spiritual state before God, and he has no shortage of explanations that he has created to do so. All of man's proposed remedies, his prescriptions, are not in concert with the truth of Scripture, but rather they are in direct opposition to it. They are not therapeutic. Excuse me, they are therapeutic. They are not theological. They are dangerous, not doctrinal. They are external, not effective in addressing man's primary issue. And they are competing ideologies that set themselves up against the truth of God's word. If we are to understand what it means to truly seek to change biblically, we must understand the faulty paths that the world has proposed to care for the soul. These are approaches that while they might sound plausible, that may give the appearance of change, they cannot produce any true spiritual change. These paths must be known. They must be discerned. And they must be understood to be insufficient in addressing man's greatest issue of sin and his need for biblical change. First path I want us to examine is psychology. Psychology. Psychology, by definition, is the study of the soul. It seeks to understand why man is the way that he is, and then it seeks to create a series of processes and therapies to help him change his behavior. Psychology is built upon the foundation of atheism and secular humanism. It removes the knowledge of God from its understanding and it applies evolutionary theory in its desire to seek to understand man in an attempt to change him. Therefore, psychology is no more a science than evolution is a science. I vividly remember the day as a psychology major when one of my professors made somewhat of a startling statement to the class. He said, we are merely attempting to understand why man is the way that he is, and in doing so, we are attempting to create therapies and theories that may help us to address the issues of life. How could he say such a thing? Because psychology is theory. It is evolutionary, just like its basis. It is always growing. It is always trying to come to a clear understanding and apply therapies that might help. It's not a science and it is not a system that begins with God, but rather it begins with the denial of God. It postulates out of man's fallen nature, and by nature it sets itself up against the truth of Scripture. Psychology provides an alternative and contradicting understanding to the scripture and seeking to explain man's nature, the source of man's problems, who is responsible for his problems, how to treat his problems, what is guilt, and how to resolve that guilt. System teaches that one pursues change for the purpose of greater personal satisfaction, of having their needs met, of inner healing from some past experience, finding people who will accept them for who they are, and with the goal of building self confidence, self esteem, and self worth. In addition, It is psychology that seeks to redefine man's sin as a host of other mental issues. The DSM-5, which is the the manual, the ever-growing manual for psychological treatment, redefines man's sin. Lying has been redefined as storytelling. Drunkenness is a disorder and a disease, not a sin. Pedophilia is no longer a perversion, but in previously listed as a psychiatric disorder, even today, though, it is seen as even normal and acceptable in some cases. Psychology does not, nor it cannot, address most man's most fundamental issues of how man is to deal with his sin and its consequences, but listen, it rather redefines it. Just as Adam 
attempted to redefine his sin, shift his guilt to Eve to create his own remedy for sin and attack the character of God as a scapegoat for his disobedience. So psychology follows the world's pattern to do the same. Through diagnoses, it erases any guilt of sin. It redefines man's sin into a palatable condition. It points, it doesn't point to man's sin and his need for forgiveness, but rather it tells you to blame everyone else for your sin, thus making you not a sinner who is responsible for his sin, but a victim who cannot be blamed for their current condition. It is psychology that believes that one's environment or circumstances determine why a person is the way that they are. It's because of this that man's issues are dealt with through blame shifting, that their perspective and experience is the only truth that matters, and that the issues of their life are what truly has made them the way that they are. According to psychology, there is no need to be transformed and conformed to Christ, only that one's life is fulfilled. Names you will know, Freud, Rogers, Maslow, Skinner, all of those men who in their rejection of God and his truth created systems of thinking and remedies that are in complete opposition to the word of God. They create behavior modification therapies that seek to clean the outside of the cup while they never address the issues of the heart. While all the time they are experimenting on individuals to see if their therapies will, quote, work. They are those who amputate limbs instead of facilitating true heart change. But the issue and the great concern is the influence that these theories have had in the church over the last 35 to 40 years. It brings us to the second belief path And that is the integrationist psychology. Integrationist psychology. It's called integrationist psychology because it seeks to marry psychology with some aspect of biblical truth. There are those who may affirm that the scripture is God's word. They may even say that it is primary in helping people to change, but they call for an integration of human observation, scientific research in order to help people deal with the complexities of life and to produce true change. Argument for integrationism begins with what they say is a very logical human argument. They would say that since all of truth is God's truth, and since psychological research findings and human understanding are part of that body of truth that makes up God's general revelation to mankind, then they would say that since it comes from God, it is as dependable and authoritative as the Scripture itself. The integrationist is basically elevating general revelation, that is God's revelation through the created order and the human conscience, to the level of special revelation, God's spoken word to us, and Christ is incarnate word. Integrationists then therefore accept other sources of truth outside of the scripture as the means that must be used to if they're really going to truly help people. They would point to things like discoveries made through behavioral studies, theories created from human logic and reasoning, advanced medical training and psychological treatments, and even someone's own personal feelings or intuition of what they believe to be true. Therefore, they can easily integrate what psychology has to say as well as what the scripture teaches and they believe it that there is a union that must be integrated in order to comprehensively deal with man's issues. One of the main conduits for integration of psychology was Dallas Theological Seminary in the mid to late 1990s. I was introduced to this ideology for the first time my senior year in college and a desire to go to seminary. I met with a man who had recently graduated from DTS and who was owning and running his own counseling practice there in town. 
It was in our meeting that he went on to attempt to explain to me that he valued psychology and counseling. That men like Freud and men like Rogers, who were godless men, had some very good things to say, and those things must be integrated into our counseling if we are to truly help people change. It's clear as he spoke that while he would say that he affirmed the scripture, he also held the learnings and findings of these men as equal in weight and authority. But the issue with this view is that in elevating general revelation to the same level of special revelation, they are assigning a purpose to general revelation that God did not intend. General revelation, according to Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, as seen in the created order, and in Romans 2, 15, in the conscience, provides man with an inherent knowledge of God, so that as Romans says, man is without excuse. To say it another way, the Bible affirms that there is no such thing as an atheist. They are only those who, in experiencing that knowledge through the created order and the conscience and their knowledge of God, it says that they are those who are suppressing that truth in unrighteousness. But general revelation, or excuse me, general revelation serves as the universal basis for God's judgment of mankind for their sin. But general revelation cannot bring a person to a saving knowledge of Christ and it cannot produce spiritual change in the life of the believer. God has not assigned that role to general revelation. He has assigned the means of salvation and the means of sanctification to special revelation. That is Christ, the Word incarnate, and the Scripture. Listen to how the scripture describes the necessity of special revelation in our salvation. James 1.18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth. What's he talking about? Salvation. How did he do it? By the word of truth. Romans 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing, that's a spiritual understanding, and hearing by what? The word of Christ. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. What is that imperishable seed? Through the living and enduring word of God. In relation to our sanctification, our growing conformity to Christ, it was our Lord himself that we saw a couple weeks ago that gave his church the means of his sanctification. It was what? Sanctify them in the truth. And what's the source of that truth? Your word is truth. General revelation, while giving all mankind a knowledge of God that he exists, cannot bring someone to salvation or to sanctify them. Therefore, these psychological observations and findings cannot be held in any way at the same level of authority as the scripture, and they must be rejected as the means of biblical change. We cannot mess around in taking philosophies of the world under the banner of general revelation into the church and attempt to validate them through these logical rationalizations. As the church, we use the means that God has ordained to save and to sanctify his church. Listen, a broke clock is right twice a day, but we do not use that broken clock to tell time. While there may be some level of truths in these observations, it is impossible for these worldly observations to produce spiritual life and spiritual change. It is this integrationist view that has even produced another gospel, a false gospel, the gospel of psychology. You hear this everywhere in churches. It is a gospel that deals not with sin and its penalty, but one that declares Christ came to satisfy you and your desires to be your spiritual guru and fix all of your emotional hurts, and he came to meet your need for love and belonging. 
It is this gospel where the blood of Christ is not the propitiation for sin, but that which was spilt to meet your need of validation and self-worth. It is this gospel that calls the sinner not to, it is, the, it is this gospel that calls the sinner not to believe, not for the purpose of being reconciled to a holy God, but rather it calls for them to accept Jesus so he can meet their felt needs, provide inner healing, and deal with whatever form of guilt that is plaguing their life. This gospel is largely a sentimental appeal to man's self-worship and fallen nature in a desire to have every longing of his heart fulfilled in Christ. In short, it is calling to believe upon Christ as your therapist, not as Savior and Lord. But there are two distinct issues with this integrationist view. One we've already covered, but two more. And that is is that man's observation are always interpreted or bent through a fallen mind. Man's observations are always interpreted and bent through a fallen mind. Romans 1, 18 through 32 tells us that man by nature is constantly suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness. And in doing so, Romans says, as he does so, he is given over to further depravity. And in doing so, it says that his mind is darkened. Implications of this reality is that man lives in constant hostility to God. Therefore, he can never truly be objective in his evaluations of findings and observations. He will always have a bent towards distorting them or reinterpreting them for the purpose of maintaining his independence and autonomy from God. Paul says this in Romans 1, 21 through 23. He says, For even though that they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, of four-footed animals, of crawling creatures. Unlike God in his truth, that is pure, that is holy, that is objective, propositional, Man by nature is a suppressor of the truth, even of the general revelation of God. Therefore, observations, findings, and even empirical evidence cannot be used as a legitimate means to help people grow spiritually because they will always be skewed and reinterpreted through a fallen mind. You might say, I mean, Brad, can one million psychologists really be wrong in a particular issue? The answer to that is, yes, they can. You might say, well, I've I've been helped by some of these therapies. I've seen some benefit in my life from these kind of therapies. What you must understand is that all you've done is modify behavior. Or maybe put some external restraints around your life that are motivated by selfishness or pride or fear. What we are talking about here is how one is changed at the heart level. Where only true change can occur. This is a change that can only be produced spiritually by addressing man's true issue through God's ordained means. And in man becoming a new spiritual creation, he then only can change. Why? Secondly, because Scripture alone is authoritative and sufficient in dealing with the soul. Scripture alone is authoritative and sufficient to deal with the soul. To say that human observation, research findings, one's own experience, advanced medical trainings, and theories built on human logic have some level of authority in dealing with the soul, it is to deny the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture in dealing and helping people to change. If one is to invite these competing authorities into the process of change, you will find that human wisdom will always be striving against the higher authority. 
This is a dangerous path because it will always be seeking to reinterpret the scripture through the grid of experience in observation. It is when we invite those other authorities into the process of biblical change that instead of the scripture being the only authority by which our experiences, observations, and even empirical evidence are brought into subjection to, it is the truth of God's word that becomes that which is tested through these secular human means. This thinking has at its core what we call a theology from below. A theology that begins with man. It is man-centered, beginning with man and his experience, his reasoning, and his logic, and then seeks those out as a method by which he then interprets the Scripture. Example of this is pretty clear. Some would say that through empirical science, human observation, and logical reasoning, that all of those tell us that the earth was actually formed over millions of years. What's the implication? If human wisdom becomes the authority, then I cannot accept the Genesis account of a literal six-day creation. If human observation and empirical science tells me that there are issues of my life that given the level of, quote, trauma that I experience or difficulty, that they exceed the Bible's help in these matters. And that I must then seek out professionals or so-called experts. Then the implication is that I am faced with is that when the great difficulties of life, even those who would classify themselves as, quote, traumatic, are brought into my life, then I might turn to the scripture in some small manner. But I'm going to put my trust and my hope in those so called experts who have been specially trained to deal with trauma from a psychological perspective. And in doing so, what am I acknowledging? What am I affirming? that the scriptures are not sufficient to deal with all the matters of life and godliness. It's tragic to me when I speak to those who say and profess they believe in the authority and the sufficiency of scripture that they look to the scripture for the everyday things of life. And yet when they face something they feel reaches a level of difficulty beyond their understanding, they undergo some painful experience that they can't deal with in and of themselves, that they chunk the scripture and they begin to seek out secular help because they believe they have a special knowledge, special training to help them deal with these difficulties. Why? Because the church has been so psychologized that at the hint of any difficulty or painful experience, it leaves the Bible on the shelf and it seeks out the alleged professionals. Listen, God isn't wringing his hands in heaven saying, I just don't know how I'm going to deal with this. I haven't seen something like this before in someone's life. He isn't thinking, this is beyond my pay grade. Maybe they need to seek out human wisdom to truly deal with this issue. Listen, if you're in Christ this morning and saving you, God gave you all that you need to change. It was in hearing of the good news of the gospel that God gave you spiritual life by the Spirit. It was in that effectual call that as you heard the gospel that day, that God by his sovereign grace was in that message of the gospel calling you to believe. And it was as he did so that he gave you spiritual life. In an instant, you went from being dead to be made alive Your old person died and passed away, and you were made a new creation. You went from being darkened in your understanding to have the very wisdom of God imparted to you by the Spirit. Your cold, dead heart that had been led astray through the human wisdom and spirit of the age was replaced by a new heart. One that has as its chief end the desire to know God and to obey Him. 
your futile way of thinking that was dominated by those philosophies and the ideologies of the evil world system is now desiring of, it is reliant upon, and it is spiritually able to walk in obedience to God's word. And it was in saving you that God gave you the spiritual capacity to see the instrument of his word to deal with man's sin and to produce spiritual change. Peter, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit, provides us with the most simple yet profound understanding of the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. Seeing that His divine power has granted to what? Some things, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Listen, there are those who would say that they believe in the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture, and yet what they mean is that they believe it to be authoritative and sufficient only to the level that they determine it to be. Meaning they determine to what extent that they will allow it to be that sole authority before they let in other competing authorities to take precedent. But here, Peter blows that postulation objectively out of the water. Peter says that God himself has given us everything that is comprehensive spiritual knowledge, not limited knowledge that must be filled in by secular thinking, but rather exhaustive, comprehensive for issues pertaining to all of life and godliness. Everything that you need to know about your sin, everything that you need to know to be reconciled to God, to come to know salvation, to grow in sanctification, to endure hardship and suffering, to know how to live in a fallen culture around you, how to live a God-honoring life, how to raise your kids, how to love your spouse, how to think through the most complex and difficult trials of life, God has given you the wisdom in his book. Arthur Mayhew speaks of the sufficiency of the word of God in these ways. It is active, it is living, it is certain, it is powerful, it is cleansing, it is nourishing, it is sanctifying, it is of infinite worth. It is the standard by which we examine ourselves rightly. It cleanses us from sin. It is the source of new life. It lights the direction we are to walk in. It is a weapon to be used against Satan and the flesh. It is the only true source and understanding of the world, and it brings both judgment and pain and potency. Why is the Scripture authoritative? Why is it sufficient? Because God ordained it to be so. Listen, the scripture that you hold in your hands this morning is inspired by God. It is God-breathed, the product of his breath. Just as your words are the product of your breath, so the scripture, every word of the scripture is the product of God's breath. It's not just that the ideas or the principles of Scripture are authoritative and sufficient. It's not that there are just parts of it that are authoritative and sufficient. In every word of it, God's voice speaks forth. Psalm 138.2, for you have magnified your word according to all your name. Psalm 119.89, forever, O Lord, Your word is settled in the heavens. Listen, cultural ideologies will ebb and flow. Findings, observation, intuition will change. But it is God's word that is established. It is firm, settled in the heavens. It endures every age. It will always be relevant and that it is always the source of truth and of spiritual life. Listen, just as God himself is eternal, just as he himself never changes, just as he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, so his word will serve as the eternally true anchor for his church. If I could say it simply, there is no other wisdom, there is no other knowledge that can save you and in saving you to cause you to grow in conformity to Christ other than the scripture. It is the scripture that God himself ordained to be the instrument that he uses to redeem his church and to sanctify 
his church. It's because of this reality that John MacArthur states this. He says, true psychology, that is the study of the soul, can be done only by Christians. And by that, he's not talking about the secular practice. He's talking about the reality of the study of the soul, the application of the truth. Since only Christians have the resources for understanding and the transformation of the soul, since the secular discipline of psychology is based on godless assumptions and evolutionary foundations, it is capable of dealing with people only superficially and only on the temporal level. The Christian must be doing soul work in the realm of the deep things of the Word of God and of the Spirit, not fooling around in the shadows of behavior modification. Why should a believer choose to to behavior modification when he has the tools for spiritual transformation. Like a surgeon wreaking havoc with a butter knife instead of using a scalpel. The most skilled counselor is the one who most carefully, prayerfully, and faithfully applies the divine sanctification, shaping one another into the image of God. Listen, you may be here this morning and and you are either struggling in a sin or in, and or in your conviction regarding how change is produced in the believer's life. Listen, let the scripture speak to you this morning. It is this reality that provides the believer the greatest assurance of change. That in God saving you and in giving you a new nature, he has given you the spiritual capacity to change and he has given you the instrument of that change in his word. Next week we'll look in detail at this process of biblical change, but this morning, maybe you're not in Christ. And your guilt before God is just as Adam's guilt is. And maybe you're acting just as Adam did, blaming others for your sin, validating your sin by holding God's holy nature in contempt, seeking the human wisdom of the world to sow fig leaves, as it were, over your nakedness, believing that you can hide from God's righteous judgments. And while fearing God, you do not do so in the appropriate manner, merely being fearful of being exposed by him rather than running to him, confessing your sin and pleading for forgiveness. Today, you know what your true issue truly is. It is not your search for significance. It is the reality of your sin before an infinitely holy God. The guilt that you know that weighs you down is not some repressed feelings from your childhood. It's not the fear of being alone. It's not the desire of having your self-esteem met. It is the weight of your sin constantly testifying to you through the conscience that is constantly making you aware that you stand condemned before God for your sin. Listen, you cannot turn to human wisdom for help. You cannot somehow modify your behavior to make yourself acceptable to God. You cannot seek those who validate your feelings in order to escape God's judgment against you. Apart from that new spiritual life that God by his sovereign grace produces, you'll remain in your spiritually helpless state, unable to do anything that is pleasing to him. Today, the call to you is to turn from your sin. Turn from your darkened understanding. Turn from your futile way of life. And turn from all of those worldly counselors that have told you that you're not as bad as you think that you are. And in doing so, in turning from your sin, agree with God's assessment of your spiritual condition and of your greater spiritual need to have that sin forgiven. And in agreeing with him that you are by nature a sinner, Turn from your sin, turn from your disobedience, and forsake your sinful way of life. And in turning from your sin, turn to the one that God has given as a payment for your sin.
unlike Adam, who once enjoyed perfect communion with God but sinned and fell under the condemnation. It was our Lord Jesus Christ who was the better Adam, who lived in perfect obedience to God, and in doing so, He is the one who dealt with our sin and His death eternally. He is the one that did away with that true guilt before God for our sin. Romans 8, 33 through 34 says, Who will bring then a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who now also intercedes for us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that provides the only answer for God's or man's greatest issue. He is the one that accepting his sacrifice that the Father raised from the dead, certifying his appeasement for sin, is our Lord who now intercedes on our behalf before the Father. So in seeing our iniquities, in seeing our transgression, now all the Father sees are the merits of Christ imputed to those who believe. Listen, how is true spiritual change possible? It must begin first with a spiritual transformation. A new spiritual life that comes to you in salvation. Without that, you will never be able to change in the way that God requires or he enables. It's only in being born again that man is spiritually able to live in a way that glorifies God. And he can only do so as he obeys his word. Next week, we'll look at the process of biblical change, and in doing so, we will see what it truly means to live the Christian life. Let's pray. Our Father, your word is pure. It is holy. It is inspired by you. It is the product of your breath, every word of it, down to every dot and tittle. It is the instrument by which you redeem It is the instrument by which you call sinners to yourself. It is the instrument that through its truth that you can form your church to the image of Christ. Father, forgive us when we have entertained the worldly counselors. Father, forgive us when we have let our ears be led astray by the pied pipers of psychology and whatever else is out there. Father, help us to have that firm understanding, that conviction of your word, that it is both authoritative and sufficient. Father, no matter the complexity, no matter the depth or the height of suffering, there are answers to it for us in your word. Father, forgive us when we are tempted to go into the secular world and to fill in the apparent blanks that we believe that your word doesn't give us. Help us to rely upon, to chain ourselves to the scripture. Father, our desire to, is to grow as a church, to grow individually. And you have given us the instrument, the means of that growth. Father, help us to apply ourselves to it, to know it, to study it, to meditate on it, to walk in its truths. And Father, in doing so, that you might produce the fruit for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.